Okay, let's start. Uh, I'm Alex from Evernim. I'm a lead software engineer at Evernim. And uh, also I'm a maintainer of Hyperledger Indie project. And today I'm going to tell you about uh, one of the sub-projects of Indie. This is uh, Indie Distributed Ledger. So, uh, what do you know about Indie? Uh, for most people, Indie is all about identity. That's true. And uh, not everyone uh, actually realized that uh, India has its own distributed ledger. And it has its own implementation of distributed ledger. And uh, this uh, implementation not dependent on any other blockchain platforms, any other blockchain systems. This is uh, really one of the distributed ledgers, which is part of uh, Hyperledger. Uh, and uh, what is important, this is a BFT, PBFT-like uh, implementation of a consensus protocol. Uh, moreover, this uh, implementation is uh, in production as part of Sovereign Network uh, for more than two years. Uh, and also, India is one of uh, active uh, Hyperledger projects. Uh, I mentioned Sovereign Foundation and Sovereign Networks, but there are also uh, another deployments of Indie Network, of Indie Ledger, such as Findi, Kiva, uh, and so on. So it's uh, working for more than two years in production and has uh, real customers and real applications working on top of this. Okay, so what we are going to discuss today. Uh, the first of all, we are going to uh, understand why we need a public blockchain in self-sovereign identity. So why we need a blockchain in these uh, kind of identity solutions. Then we are going to consider uh, what projects uh, Hyperledger Indie Ledger consists of. And uh, we are going to uh, discuss the architecture of uh, Indie Ledger, uh, how the actual databases uh, look like, and of course uh, deal with the consensus protocol. Uh, what consensus protocol India implements and uh, what is specific of this uh, protocol. Okay, so self sovereign identity. Uh, you know, there were other uh, great topics uh, describing what is areas, what is India, what is verifiable credentials. This is also just a very uh, quick overview that uh, in order to have a verifiable credentials, uh, the issuer usually creates the issues uh, claim uh, which is signed by him, and it's uh, issued in the form of a digital verifiable credential, which is stored on the prover's wallet, and then can be presented to a verifier as, uh, in a, as a zero knowledge proof uh, form. So the question is, uh, why do we need a blockchain here, actually? But you can see some errors. And uh, we need uh, the blockchain because of multiple reasons. Uh, the first reason that we need a schema for these credentials. We need to know how it looks like. Uh, we need to know what is the public key of the issuer uh, to be used for signing this credential. Uh, we need to know uh, whether this uh, credential is revoked or not. We need to have a, a list of uh, revocation uh, entries, uh, the revocation registry. So, but in general, uh, why we need the blockchain here? Why not just a database? And the answer is that we need a decentralized uh, source of trust. And also, we would like the ledger to be public. So that it uh, means that anyone in the ecosystem, anyone in the world, uh, should be able to read this data for identity use cases. And it's pretty important to understand what data in uh, India in verifiable credentials workflow is on the blockchain and what data is considered to be private and never goes to the blockchain. Uh, and again, here you all know about GDPR, about the laws in uh, California, and so on. So the rule of uh, thumb here is that no private data is ever written to the blockchain, to the Indie Ledger. But what is written then? Uh, some public DIDs, public decentralized identifiers, and the corresponding uh, DID documents, it can be written to the blockchain. Uh, issuers public keys, which will be used for verification of uh, credentials, it goes to the blockchain. Uh, credentials schema and information about revocation. That's usually what we can see on the blockchain. And what is never written to the blockchain is pairwise DIDs, you know, this peer-to-peer -peer communication that uh, Daniel Harmon uh, was telling about, uh, credentials itself, proofs, it never goes to the blockchain. And of course, private keys. 
Okay, uh, so in the ledger, in the distributed ledger, it consists of two projects in a hyperledger. This is uh, in the plenum and uh, in the node. What is the difference? Uh, in the plenum is a kind of general purpose uh, project uh, related to implementation of the consensus protocol, uh, the ledger database state, and so on. And in the node, it's built on top of this, on top of Indie Plenum, and it uh, introduces and implements identity-related stuff, identity-related transa transactions. Uh, for example, uh, if you would like to know how the schema transaction or credential definition transactions from the Indie world look like, uh, you should go to Indie Node. But if you're interested in uh, consensus protocols, uh, in this stuff, then you should go to Indie Plenum. In general, uh, Indy is a ledger purpose built for identity. But uh, from my previous explanation, it follows that in principle it can be used as a, as a general purpose ledger. So Plenum is a core stuff, and uh, you can extend Plenum, uh, implementing custom transactions, because we have so-called concept of pluggable request handlers, <laughs> and you can even implement your own plugins. That's actually what Indie Node does. So it uh, extends uh, pluggable request handlers interfaces and implements identity-related stuff on top of the common logic uh, within Indie Plenum. So it's, it's pretty important to understand that in general, Indie Plenum can be used as a general purpose ledger. So a uh, brief overview of uh, Indie Plenum and Node. It's uh, written in Python. Uh, it depends on ZeremQ, IndieCrypto, and currently uh, we're migrating to Ursa, and uh, Lipsodium. Uh, it follows uh, modular architecture and message uh, driven behavior, and yeah, we've been working on improving this. Uh, and also we do care about tests in Indie, so it has extensive test coverage, it uh, tries to follow TDD, it has a lot of unit tests, integration tests, and also simulation tests, property-based uh, testing is pretty important for uh, distributed ledger and uh, BFT-like consensus protocol. Uh, also, we have a number of system tests and uh, load tests. And it's uh, important to mention that uh, we do tests on a real uh, deployments of uh, 25 nodes pools, uh, which are distributed in different parts of the world, in AWS, for example. So, uh, Plenum and the node ledger is really tested uh, at scale and in real environment. Uh, so, in the uh, ledger can be considered as a public permissioned one. So, you know, Bitcoin is about decentralized money, Ethereum is mostly about decentralized applications, and Indy is about decentralized identity. And so, why it's public? It's public because anyone can read from the ledger. And why it's permissioned? Because it's not like Bitcoin or Ethereum that where anyone can uh, you know, join the network and participate in uh, processing transactions. Uh, in India, uh, only the specific uh, stewards can join the network and can uh, own and has a node which validates transactions. And also, write request, uh, write access to the ledger is uh, permissioned that we have some policies uh, restricting this. So, uh, on the heart, we have the validator pool consisting of nodes. And this is more or less fixed number of nodes, well-defined nodes. Of course, it needs to be distributed. It needs to be owned by different so-called stewards who uh, has a private uh, key for this node, who does the, the maintenance of this node, make sure that it's connected to all other nodes in the pool, and so on. And this uh, validator pool, uh, it's uh, responsible for actual processing of uh, requests and uh, ordering them as part of consensus protocol. In addition to validator pool, we may have so-called observer pool, and this is the nodes uh, uh, which can process read requests. The number of validator pool nodes in a validator pool is usually quite, uh, uh, it's not infinite because, uh, because of the consensus protocol that we use. Uh, the current net, uh, sovereign networks usually have about 25 nodes there. But the number of observer pools can be, uh, it, we may have much more nodes there. 
So uh, the validators, uh, as I said, they, uh, uh, they have a consensus logic implemented there. Uh, that's what, what they do when they get a transaction, when they get a uh, write request. They come to a consensus, uh, what is the sequence number of this uh, request, in what order it should be written to the ledger. Uh, by ledger here, I mean like a ledger database. So each node replicates, uh, replicates uh, these databases, so it has uh, the same uh, information, the same data on every node. Uh, and yeah, as any other PBFT-like protocol, we have uh, n nodes, which is equal to 3f plus 1, where f is the maximum number of uh, crashed or unavailable or malicious nodes. And uh, we use ZeroMQ uh, as a secure transport. Uh, it's TCP-based protocol. It uses uh, authenticated encryption instead of digital signatures. Uh, and uh, BLS signatures. It's also part of consensus protocol to be able to verify the data uh, written to the ledger. Uh, I'm going to tell you about BLS signatures a bit more in, in the next slides. Okay, so let's uh, consider how write and read requests are processed uh, by the ledger. Uh, write requests, so the ledger is uh, permissioned, so any write request uh, must be signed or multi-signed by the users, and we use uh, ED25519 digital signature here. And write request is sent to all nodes in the system, all nodes from the validator pool. And we expect to get F plus one equal replies to be, uh, to be sure that it's uh, actually written. As for the read requests, we have only one error here. It's sufficient to send a read request to one node only, to a single node only, and uh, the user can trust the result, the reply, uh, because of the BLS uh, aggregated signatures and because of the state proofs. So we are going to uh, talk about this in more details. And no signatures uh, are required there. So the ledger is public from the read requests point of view. Let's talk about authentication and authorization. So uh, authentication, as well as authorization, is based on the information present uh, on the ledger. So uh, as I said, every write request must be signed, and the signature is verified against a public key, which is also present on the ledger. Uh, this public key is put there as a part of a DID doc or kind of information associated with the DID of the user, of the sender of the transaction, so that all the nodes can get a request and can get the associated public key from the ledger and verify the signature. And uh, for read requests, we don't require any authentication. Anyone can read. As for authorization, about whether a person is allowed to do this particular action, this is also based on the information uh, present stored on the ledger. And uh, we are using role-based approach here, where for every DID, uh, we have uh, an associated role, and also we have a concept of configurable out rules, so that we can set uh, for every action how many signatures of a particular role uh, are required. And we can use OR and AND expressions in order to set this, and this is uh, the authorization policy which is stored in a config uh, ledger. Read request, again, no authorization is required. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the ledger itself as a database uh, which is replicated on every node. So uh, the ledger consists of a transaction log, and this is just an ordered list of all the transactions which are written uh, to the pool. And we have a Merkle tree for the whole ledger attached. Uh, and the Merkle tree, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of a common structure in all the blockchains. Uh, and we have actually three databases uh, associated with every ledger, transaction log itself, and two databases for Merkle leaves and Merkle nodes. We use RocksDB as a key value storage uh, to store every of these uh, data structures. And also it's worth mentioning that we have a so-called catch-up process, so that if a node is lagging behind or is just started, uh, it needs to get uh, the information, uh, missing information, to have the equal representation, the equal ledger. And this is what catch-up procedure does. 
all other information, all other state of the node can be restored from the ledger. So, uh, as I mentioned, we use Merkle trees and uh, we use a, a consistency check just by verifying that uh, two Merkle trees root hashes are equal and this is a very fast and convenient way to see that uh, two ledgers are equal during part of our consensus protocol. Uh, also, we use uh, state proofs or inclusion proofs uh, to, uh, to verify the results of get transaction. So if you ask for a transaction, you can verify that this uh, data is really actually part of this uh, miracle tree. And it's also used during the catch-up procedure when you get the missing information from other nodes. Okay, uh, Indy has multiple ledgers. It's not just one. Uh, so we have uh, so-called audit ledger, and this is a ledger uh, which actually introduces the order ordering across all the ledgers, all the other ledgers. So it can be considered as a source of blocks. Also, we have a pool ledger, and this is a ledger consisting information about the current state of the pool, what nodes are in the pool, what are other public keys, and so on. We have config ledger, and this is a ledger containing some uh, information about, uh, for example, validation of transactions, uh, authorization policies, some config which uh, all the nodes need to come to consensus. And domain ledger. Domain ledger is the main ledger containing application-specific or identity-specific data. So if we consider uh, Indy and identity use cases, then all the transactions such as schema, cred dev, revocation, it's all part of the domain ledger. And it's worth mentioning that plugins can add new ledgers, can register and add new ledgers for their purposes. So, uh, pool ledger, uh, the, in general, the current configuration of the pool consists uh, of a block of Genesis transactions uh, and a number of so-called node transactions associated with every node in the pool. And you can, add, uh, you can use this node transaction, for example, to add a new node or to remove a node from the pool or to edit information about this node, for example, rotate its keys. And uh, on this example, you can see that from these four Genesis transactions and these five node transactions, you can get the current uh, state of the pool. So it contains actually four nodes in this case. Audit ledger. So the main purpose of uh, audit ledger is to introduce synchronization and ordering between all other ledgers. Uh, and also it can be used for external audit of data written in multiple ledgers. Uh, audit transaction, every audit transaction can be considered as a block uh, associated with a sequence number and also having references to uh, Merkle tree root hashes of every ledger that it has. So just by following audit ledger, you can restore the real ordering of all the transactions and what ledger it belongs to. And also, audit ledger can be is used a lot in uh, the general uh, consensus protocol verification. It's used in restoring uh, current primaries, for example, and some state internal state of every node. State. Uh, so, in addition to ledger, ledger database on every node, we have a concept of state. This is kind of a snapshot of the current ledger. So each ledger except audit has a state, and uh, in principle this is a Patricia Merkle tree, very similar to how it's used in Ethereum. It's a combination of Radix tree, like a key value storage, and a Merkle tree. Uh, in other words, a state maps the ordered list of transactions as stored in the ledger to a current state as a dictionary, like a current snapshot. Uh, we use RocksDB as a key value storage here as well, so uh, why it's needed, uh, for example, uh, we have a DID and we have a key associated with the DID and we, need to we can rotate this key, we can change the value. So the state uh, will be just uh, the current value of this key for a particular DID. So it can allow you to get the current state which is uh, uh, very, which is really uh, actually used uh, when you process read requests, when you return replies to the clients, uh, and uh, uh, when you do some verification of the data to be stored on the ledger. 
Now let's move to consensus protocol. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, India has its own implementation of a consensus protocol, and this is Byzantine fault tolerant uh, protocol. So in general, we have uh, two types of consensus protocols. This is CFT, crash fault tolerant, and BFT, Byzantine fault tolerant. In a CFT world, uh, the nodes can be unavailable, uh, can crash, and the protocol will still come to consensus if no more than a particular number of such nodes uh, unavailable. But in BFT world, uh, it's even more. The nodes can be available, but they may just behave maliciously. They can send some arbitrary data to different nodes. Uh, but if the number of these nodes is less than f, where the total number of nodes is 3f plus 1, then the protocol can still come to consensus. And uh, you may have heard uh, the famous, uh, the famous um, story about Byzantine generals and where it where it's came from. Okay, so uh, plenum, uh, in the plenum, it has uh, implementation of a protocol which is called RBFT, and this is a PBFT-like uh, consensus protocol. So you know, uh, PBFT was probably the first practical Byzantine fault tolerant uh, protocol created in 1999 by uh, Miguel Castro and uh, Barbara Liskov, and you can consider RBFT as uh, uh, a multiple instances of PBFT running at the same time, and it helps to, uh, to notice some malicious behavior in the network better. We are going to discuss it uh, on the next slides. In general, uh, PBFT-like protocols, they have uh, better throughput and low latency than proof of work, because that's why they're so good in uh, permissioned networks. So, uh, any uh, PBFT protocol it consists of three main uh, phases, which is called uh, three-phase commit. And uh, uh, the first phase uh, there is when a primary, and this is a leader-based, a primary-based protocol, uh, where a primary proposes the next set of transactions to be ordered. And the primary sends a so-called pre-prepare message. All other nodes, they come to agreement using prepare and commit messages. And uh, after they got a quorum of commit messages, the transaction is considered to be ordered. It's written to the ledger, and the reply is sent uh, to a client. Why we have actually two phases, prepare and commit, not just one? This is because the primary can be malicious. The protocol is leader-based, leader and the primary can be malicious in uh, uh, different ways. It can be just disconnected or stopped, or it can intentionally degrade performance, or it may send some inconsistent data. In all of these cases, uh, if other nodes notice that the primary is malicious, they need to change the primary. And this is a process which is called a view change. So uh, in every view, we have a different primary. When we change the primary, we go to the next view. And in general, view change in plenum is implemented in the same way as in original PBFT paper. Uh, we use a variant without digital signatures. And that's actually why we have multiple instances of the PBFT uh, like protocol in RBFT, that every instance has its own primary, and they all uh, execute at the same time, uh, calculate throughput, latency, and compare performance. And if other instances, backup instances, sees that the master protocol instance, which is actually the one which executes the real transactions, uh, degrades performance, they do a view change, they change the primary. This is the reason uh, why RBFT is better in catching this kind of uh, behavior. In general, the view change uh, protocol in PBFT, uh, well, the main thing here is to be, make sure that all transactions that could be potentially ordered on at least one correct node, node should eventually be ordered on all the nodes. And this is done by uh, letting the next primary in a new view kind of uh, reorder all these kind of transactions which could be potentially ordered. Okay, uh, so the plenum has a number of uh, features which are worth mentioning. Uh, the first one that uh, every request, every transaction is ordered not one by one because you can see that this is quite heavy process of uh, three-phase commit and this is n-square asymptotics there. So uh, we can order a batch of transactions uh, at once in one pre prepare message which of course improves uh, performance a lot. And usually this is a trade-off between throughput and latency depending on how many transactions you include in one pre-prepare. Uh, also, as part of our consensus protocol, we check for data consistency. 
So we apply uh, all the transactions uh, optimistically in uncommitted state, and we make sure that uh, the data on our node is equal to the data on the primary. If yes, we continue to order this transaction. If not, uh, we do the view change and change the primary. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, in addition to just applying the data, we do this dynamic validation. For example, we validate that data is immutable or this is a really, uh, the user has a permission to do this action, something like this. And this verification is done against the current uncommitted state. So we apply every transaction one by one and do this verification. Uh, also, it's worth mentioning that uh, Plenum can uh, have multiple batches, multiple pre-prepares in flight. So it can process, uh, you know, like 10 pre-prepares, but all pre-prepares must be applied uh, sequentially. So if we don't have uh, pre-prepare number 12, then we need to wait or request it from other nodes before we can go further. And uh, maybe the last important thing, uh, last feature in uh, Plenum, uh, it's BLS aggregated signature. So as I mentioned before, it's sufficient to send uh, read requests to a single node only. And why the client can trust this data? It can trust because of two things. The first thing that in every reply to read request, uh, we return a proof that this request belongs to a Merkle tree, to the Patricia Merkle tree uh, on the node. That's fine. We, the client can verify that this data is on this Merkle tree. But the next question is, how would you know that uh, this Merkle tree is really the same as on other nodes? Because it can be that this node just created a fake Merkle tree and return this data to the user. And the answer to this question is that every node during consensus protocol, uh, they sign, they cryptographically sign the root hashes of the state. So that we also, in addition to the state proof, we return uh, the signature. So the client can verify the signature, can verify the root of uh, the Merkle tree and trust the data. So yeah, during the uh, commit phase, uh, Every node uh, signs the ledger Merkle root hash, the state Merkle root hash, the current timestamp, so that we have this called so-called aggregated uh, BLS multi-signature to be verified by the client. Okay, uh, well, so as a summary, uh, ledger, Indie ledger, is a ledger purpose built for identity, but uh, on the other hand, it can be used as a general purpose ledger. Uh, Indie has its own implementation of a consensus protocol uh, business default tolerant like uh, consensus protocol. Uh, in India, we have multiple ledgers. Every ledger uh, has a state, a Patricia Merkle tree state as a snapshot and has a Merkle tree. Uh, authentication authorization, uh, it's all based uh, uh, on the information present on the ledger. Uh, and uh, one of the features of, uh, important features of Indy is efficient uh, reads. You can read just from one node. You don't need to download the whole blockchain, the whole ledger. You can just send a read request and verify it with a small uh, amount of time and data required. And yeah, this is very pretty important for public permissioned ledger uh, use cases. So there are some links uh, to our code, uh, to the RBFT paper, to PBFT paper, and Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, are the observers uh, nodes uh, already, is, is, is that feature already implemented? This is feature is considered to be partially implemented. We already have the, the key things for this feature. And actually one of the key things for this feature is this one, BLS aggregated signatures, and to be able to trust the data from one node only. And also we have observer interfaces, but we don't have any real observer nodes in production. And uh, I believe there is also some, a couple of things that needs to be finished before it can go there. So it's partially implemented and we don't have real examples in Sorin. But I think it could be a great contribution from community and it would not be so hard to do this and yeah, have observer nodes in production. Is anyone uh, going to be able to run observer nodes? Uh, I believe uh, you need to maybe implement a couple of things in order how you can you know, uh, register this node and so on. But in general, uh, I think you can try to do this and it should mostly work. Yeah. 
Uh, not necessary. We consi we're considering some strategies where observer nodes could replace validators, for example, if uh, validators behave maliciously or the other way around. Uh, but in general, uh, observer node don't need to be a validator node. In terms uh, of the code, uh, it can run the same code, the same indie node or sovereign code, but it just depends on the role uh, that we assign for this particular node. Yeah, it's the problem. Yeah, it's the problem in any blockchain that it's immutable storage ever growing. Uh, actually, the information in audio transactions is not as big because it doesn't contain real data. It contains only like hashes or fruit hashes, so it's not a lot of data. But yeah, it's immutable. <laughs> Yeah, so we use uh, RocksDB as a persistent storage for this data for any, every ledger, every state, uh, we use RocksDB. So it's not in RAM, it's not in memory, it's actually persisted. RocksDB has, of course, some you know, optimizations that for frequently used data, it uses some in-memory uh, accesses. But in general, it can be persisted, and uh, in general, we can, uh, we can scale it on this level. So we can cr create multiple you know, databases, uh, and so on. Of course, it's usually a trade-off between you know how to access the data, which is fre frequently accessed, being accessed, uh, versus uh, like the disk space. But yeah, it's possible to do this. Yeah. You know that uh, we have a NIM transaction, which is, can be used to store uh, DID and the uh, public keys, but we don't have a request to just return a DID doc. This is kind of one of the features which is in our backlog. Uh, so you can just you know, process the data on the client uh, site and form the DID doc in a way it's, as it's uh, defined by W3C. And uh, in order to how to store other information required for DID docs, such as service endpoints, you know, these controllers, uh, we have a special transaction which is called a trip attribute, uh, where you can put any data associated with the DID. So you can use this transaction to store a DID doc. But in general, we have plans for a real DID doc support, more convenient for end users, so you can just request it and get back in a you know inter interoperable form. Any other questions? I believe we're a bit out of time. So I can stay here and everyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>